the the dependent origination to begin with, the Paticca Samuppada, is at the core of the Buddhist uh, philosophy because it's the Buddha's answer to many of the philosophical conundrums that existed in ancient India and have, have uh, cropped up in different forms in many other places and times, uh, right down to modern times. Um, the uh, the origin of uh, of suffering in the world uh, is uh, is um, described in different philosophies in different ways. The uh, eternalist view, the creationist view, is that there is a supreme being who created the universe, and that's the way that he created things. That, so that's that's the way things are. Um, <clears throat> the the opposite view is the um, uh, materialist nihilist view that says there's no rhyme or reason to the occurrences uh, the occurrences of our life things arise by random chance uh, both of these views share uh, they seem to be polar opposites but they share a, a strong element of arbitrariness they, they say that things arise that the experiences that we have as human beings are essentially arbitrary. In the one case, it's the arbitrary will of a creator, God. He just created things that way. And in the opposite view, uh, it's finally um, just a, a random, uh, a, a random shuffling of the deck of molecules that explains everything. And there is no ultimate purpose or rhyme or reason so there it's also arbitrary <clears throat> the the buddhist philosophical basis is is that the universe is essentially uh, orderly and causal that things arise according to causes and conditions and not otherwise this is one of the fundamental philosophical statements, and the, uh, of Buddhism, and the in the simplest the simplest formula of the dependent origination is simply that it says that because of this that arises when when this ceases that ceases, and that um, that sounds very very simple, but it's an important philosophical statement. And taken in the historical context of ancient India, it was an answer to uh, various other philosophers who taught various forms of these of this arbitrary view. The Buddha said, "No, things things do have uh, a pattern. They do arise because of causes and conditions." <clears throat> um, and his detailed explanation of this w was in in relation to the the human dilemma was in terms of the 12 nadana of the paticca samuppada the 12 uh, links or uh, uh, causal relations <clears throat> one thing uh, existing then because of this first thing, the next thing uh, comes into existence. <clears throat> the dependent origination is um, to be considered as a uh, an ongoing process, um, a circular uh, occurrence, but because of uh, as long as beings are mired in samsara, the, it will con the wheel will continue to roll. So there is no there is no starting point. Um, there's no there's no reason to 
for there to be an original starting point. There's no philosophical reason that there must be an ultimate origin. Uh, as far back as uh, as we can trace things, there's always a, pr a prior cause. Um, <clears throat> the only reason people want to postulate a first cause is because of a, lim a limit limiting of the human imagination, not a limiting of reality. There's no reason that there ought to be a first cause. Each, uh, each cause is itself an effect of a previous cause. <clears throat> but this being so, the uh, dependent origination is usually taken to begin with the link of, of ignorance, avidya, as taken as a first starting point for purposes of teaching. Uh, avidya is um, uh, not knowing. The, the, the word is exactly parallel to the English word ignorance which is also, uh, it's from a Greek root, not knowing, uh, ignosis, and in, in Pali it's awija, uh, not knowledge, the opposite of knowledge. It's a mind, it, re it represents a mind that is uh, un, uh, unseeing, it's in darkness. It doesn't see the laws of karma and cause and effect. It doesn't understand the Four Noble Truths. Um, it, it's a mind that doesn't understand the the lawful nature of existence and the, the and the, the processes of cause and effect. So it acts blindly. Um, <clears throat> You may have seen the um, uh, pictorial representation that of the uh, Paticca Samuppada that's often um, it comes originally from the Tibetan tradition, but other schools of other schools of Buddhism have picked it up in recent times, drawing a, a dependent origination as a as a wheel and showing. Um, and a little picture or an icon for each stage and ignorance is represented by a blind man stumbling along with a stick <clears throat> so from uh, from not knowing from avidya uh, we have um, because because of avidya sankara which, which means uh, compounded things formations and in this context, it means particularly volitional formations, that is, free will action, uh, that is, making karma in the world. We make karma with body, speech, and mind because, because of our ignorance. We uh, do things. We're not content or quiescent. Uh, we're restless. We're not satisfied with the uh, um, position of the of the universe as it presents itself to us at any given moment. <clears throat> I think it was a uh, uh, Thoreau who said that. Um, uh, all the trouble in the world comes because people are not content to sit quietly in their room. And it's, uh, you know, that's, that's basically it, that we, um, uh, uh, because of the, the whole, this, this whole universe, this whole experiential phenomenal universe, comes into subjective existence for us because of this, because we take action in the world. And we'll see how this works as I go through the dependent origination. <clears throat> it's also um, uh, taught that 
uh, one who has attained to the final stage of liberation, an arahant, makes no more kama. Uh, his or her actions are void of of kama. They're only effective. They're kriya. So that um, there's no more becoming for them. They've broken the, the, the wheel of dependent origination. So it's actions that are born out of ignorance that that keep the wheel turning. <clears throat> so having taken actions in the world, then uh, the next stage is vijnana, consciousness. The mind now receives the results of previous kama. <clears throat> this uh, this bears looking at for a little bit. Um, uh, in uh, in one one of the one of the recurring philosophical dilemmas in in any any uh, discussion about um, human conditions is uh, sometimes called the problem of free will. How much we have free will and how much is determined. Uh, the Buddhist answer is quite specific that our uh, experiences at this moment are entirely determined by previous uh, causes, uh, including our previous karma. But at the same time, our volitional choice at this moment is completely free. We have complete free will to to take any action or, or inaction and create fresh karma. It takes energy to exercise this volition, to exercise free will. The, the, the lazy habit of mind is to continue along with uh, uh, with this, in the same rut of habit patterns that we've built up for uh, lifetimes, and to continue along in the same habit pattern. Uh, as long as we continue in the same pattern, then uh, it's easy. We can just drift along. We're not exercising this human potential of, of uh, free will volition. We, um, but we do have this at each moment. We can set off on a brand new track with body, speech, or mind. <clears throat> Ajahn Chah gave uh, uh, a, 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 an analogy, a parable, uh, to to understand this. And in, in Thailand, in uh, um, previous times, and even even somewhat today in the back country, they they have these. They, they have these carts pulled by water buffalo with very big wheels and very narrow, very narrow uh, wheels, but very big circumference. And uh, that was the, their mode of transport. Uh, up until a few decades ago, it was the only mode of transport. Uh, and if you were going in one of these carts from between two villages, uh, if it was a commonly used track, there was a lot of traffic between these two villages, you could just get the water buffalo started and you could fall asleep and he would find his way And because the cart would just ride in the ruts. The ruts from all the other carts had dug these grooves in the ground and they would be quite deep and quite hard and the, the, the cart would just follow the, the ruts around the corners and the water buffalo would just walk one step ahead of the other and you'd get to the village without any problem. But if you wanted to go off on a side trip to a different place that, that didn't have much traffic, you would have to stop the cart, get out, unhook the water buffalo, wrestle the cart out of the, the ruts, turn it around, hook the water buffalo back up, and, and start him going. So it, it takes a huge amount of, of effort and energy to, to break out of a, a, a rut pattern. <clears throat> so that's a, a little side issue about free will. Um, to be uh, more 
specific and technical about this. In the, the Abhidhamma, um, consciousness is classified as either comically effective or uh, resultant. So that each moment of mind, we're either, if we're exercising, free, if it's a free will moment, a volitional moment, we're creating kama. And this is the sankara is in the dependent origination, the making of kama. Uh, when then consciousness, as it arises through the six sense doors, is always classed as resultant, vipaka. So that means that everything we see, hear, feel, touch, everything that rises to our mind through any of the doors is a result of previous causes, including previously made kama. So because of sankara vinyana, because of what we've done in the past, we get the experiences that we have now. <clears throat> uh, uh, one of the important um, one of the important aspects of this is that uh, in Buddhism we're taught to be very radically self-responsible. You know, you don't blame other people for your misfortunes. Uh, they're ultimately, in the last analysis, it's it's your own karma, and you have to make your own fresh karma. Uh, and there's of, of course a particular special case of this resultant vinyana, resultant consciousness at the moment of birth or coming into existence or uh, conception when a new life begins uh, it's um, the result of the exact configuration of this new being is the result of many causes, including the previous kama made in that stream of consciousness. <clears throat> so in the dependent origination, according to the commentarial definitions, uh, vinyana particularly refers to this rebirth linking consciousness. So, so the the, uh, the stage of of sankara which we've left is is active volitional, and now we're in the resultant stages, and we're going to stay there for quite a while. So this is important to understand that these subsequent stages are all automatic. There's nothing we can do about them. That we've already dealt the cards, and now they're just playing themselves out. This is just automatic. So the 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 being takes rebirth. And because of, because of the particular conditioned nature of the consciousness, conditioned by previous kama, the, the, the consciousness that will find an appropriate station of rebirth. And if the rebirth station is human, it, it means that previously that being was one who kept good sila, kept the five precepts. Uh, then the, the being will take a human rebirth. And, it, and there's different, of course, different uh, aspects to, of human rebirth. If uh, The Buddha said that, the Buddha, when he talked about kama, he mostly talked in terms of rebirth. Um, so he would say, like, if you are, uh, in one sutta he gave many examples, and he said that if you are an angry person all the time, then you're going to be ugly in your next birth. And if you uh, have a sweet, kind-hearted disposition, you're going to be very beautiful in your next birth. Um, if you're someone who uh, takes an interest in Dhamma and asks questions and thinks about Dhamma, then you're going to be intelligent and wise. If you're someone who never pays attention to Dhamma, then you're going to be stupid and ignorant. So. <clears throat> Um, so he gave many examples like this. Um, so the particular uh, comic uh, inheritance of the, of the consciousness will determine the, the nature of the being. 
and it'll determine the, the place where the being is born and the particular womb that it finds and the uh, circumstances of its unfolding. Uh, so the, the next stage is Namarupa, uh, which literally means name and form, which means body and mind. So this now that the consciousness has in, having sought rebirth, having found a place of rebirth, it now unfolds the being, and the being arises in the womb uh, uh, from this original seed, the spark, the coming together of as it says in the text, the coming together of uh, seed of the father, blood of the mother in her time, and the consciousness, the Gandhava seeking rebirth. When these three come together, the life begins, and it unfolds according to various laws, including the uh, Bija Kama, is the seed law or genetics, and the uh, Utu, uh, Utuniyama, which is the um, the laws of heat, which is the uh, maturing of the organism according to natural physical law, but also according to kama niyama, which is previous kama. So the the being will take will take form. <clears throat> so sometimes this uh, in the in the suttas, the, the human body is referred to as um, born of father and mother, fed by fed by rice, and uh, uh, created from old kama. You know, kama generated body. So the uh, the human body comes into and mind comes into existence in all its parts and pieces and and, and uh, one of the one of the aspects it, it manifests is the six sense bases, the salayatana, which is the next stage of the dependent origination. Um, as as human beings we have these this this way of contacting the world, the six sense bases and the the Buddha said that all the all the world is included in the six sense bases. That's all, all we because that is our subjective world. Um, the world that we know, and it, and it's important to um, to not be naive about this. To understand how this how this works. That that we we are creating the world that we live in subjectively with our sense impressions. If we had a different set of sense organs, we would have a different world. Uh, there are uh, creatures on this planet that have quite different sense equipment than we do, and they experience a, a different world as a result. Um, think of a, a bat, which is pretty close to blind, but has this uh, incredible echo sense that we don't have. That they can make sounds and hear and hear the echoes, and they can figure out the where the objects are, and they never collide with anything in their flight, even though they're almost blind, because they have this like radar. So they 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 live in an entirely different subjective universe. Uh, there are insects like bees that see colors that we can't even imagine because they're uh, up in the, in the um, ultraviolet uh, uh, frequency range. Our eyes are blind to that, those colors. So they see extra colors that we can't even imagine. Uh, there's many animals hear sounds much higher range than we can. So these are all entirely different subjective uh, subjective factors of experience. So we have this because of our karma as human beings. We have this particular sensory array, this way of receiving data from the outside world. Is these this particular wavelength of electromagnetic field is called light, and we can see that. That's our vision sense. 
certain range of frequencies we can hear, that's our sound sense, and so on. <clears throat> so because of these sensory uh, powers, the, the six sense bases, and we make contact. This is the pasa, the next stage. Um, <clears throat> information comes to us from the outside world. And from the point of view of Buddhist philosophy, as I said at the beginning, Buddhism is, and the teachings of the Buddha were extremely practical and uh, for a reason. The uh, reason being liberation. So we're interested in the subjective side. We're interested in what our experience as human beings is. Uh, what to get into the question of what's out there, what's the outside world, what's the nature of the outside world is uh, irrelevant to Buddhism, and uh, we don't go there. Uh, the, uh, the the texts and the philosophy doesn't go there. We're looking at the subjective side. So we have the six sense bases, and we contact our point. Our point of experience of the outside world is data coming in, and we, we make contact. Three things come together for contact. There's the impression from the outside world, a sight, a sound, you know, light waves or sound, sound vibrations, uh, etc., um, the physical organ of sense, such as the eye, ear, nose, tongue, and finally consciousness, uh, uh, the quintessentially subjective aspect of the knowing, the, the pure knowing. And so uh, that must be that must be present. So all three need to be present for uh, an act of contact to occur. So, so once an act of contact is made, then uh, the mind knows knows an object, processes an object. Um, that then vedana arises, feelings. This is the the. Uh, the habit of mind, the immediate uh, automatic instinct of mind to um, classify things as being pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Or whatever impression of sense occurs, that is, that is to us something pleasant, something unpleasant, or something neutral. Uh, everything falls into that. Everything falls into that category, those categories. And this is very automatic and instantaneous. So we uh, we we taste we taste some food, and it, it tastes delicious to us. So that's pleasant pleasant sensation. The mind alights on uh, sukha vedana, pleasant sensation. Of course, there's a whole range. There, uh, we can classify them just in terms of those three, and that's uh, basically what all that we need. But uh, there's a whole range of from very subtle, very subtle movement of mind to uh, a very um, strong, overwhelming sensations. You can think of an unpleasant sensation ranging from a, a pinprick to a, a horrible, agonizing pains. Uh, so, but there's there's still all dukkha vedana, unpleasant, unpleasant sensations. Now, up up to this point, as I've said, all this is resultant. All this is a very automatic unfolding from comic results. Uh, it just happens. This is what happens to us as human beings. We, we, uh, uh, because of previous karma, we develop our body and mind, 
and sense organs, and we contact the world, and our experience of the world is either pleasant or unpleasant or indifferent. <clears throat> so far, that's all. That's what it is. That's what the, how the universe presents itself to us. But now, at the next stage, we go from vedana to tanha to craving. Now, so now we're moving. In terms of the Four Noble Truths, we're moving into the Second Noble Truth. And in terms of um, uh, dependent origination, we're moving from past resultant to new cause causation. This is now uh, th this is now a very important point because this is where the the wheel turns around a new turning. And this is also the point where we can wrestle the ox cart out of the ditch at this point. This is where we can make a, uh, a choice to do something different. Um, because now we're actually coming into areas where volition is exercised. Um, the habit of mind is to go immediately from Vedana into craving. But if we're very conscious of what's happening, and if we have uh, developed through meditation and practice, we have developed both the mindfulness and restraint, then we can see what's happening and choose not to continue on this, this path. Um, tanha, thirst or craving, is the... Uh, desire for uh, in is desire for sensu sensual pleasures or for be for existence or for non-existence there's the three kinds um, the desire for existence or being and the desire for non-being or non-existence are opposites and we all experience them from time to time in different uh, different degrees um, the desire to exist is like the the, the life impulse and the, 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 the it can manifest as the wish to be be more to be more powerful more uh, um, more wealthy, more uh, more famous, whatever it might be, just to, to be more, to, to have more existence. Um, the desire not to be, in an extreme, the very extreme form, is suicidal impulses. But uh, we all experience it in lesser forms when we want to the, get rid of the burden of consciousness. Um, this uh, uh, oversleeping or um, uh, making ourselves dull with uh, um, uh, mindless entertainment like watching stupid television shows or uh, any, uh, any, any form of, of escape from uh, from higher consciousness and retreating into a duller state of existence is we bhava tanha or the will not to be <clears throat> now, but kam kamha tanha the will for sensual desires is most relevant in uh, uh, terms of dependent origination <clears throat> because it's very much related to this uh, previous stage of, of uh, Vedana, feelings. We have uh, pleasant feelings, unpleasant feelings. And uh, if you look at, um, the, if you look, uh, examine all the multitude of things that we desire in the world, they always trace back to this uh, the same root 
that we're either trying to maximize pleasant feeling or minimize unpleasant feeling. So beings m desire all kinds of things. Uh, um, uh, if you you uh, you desire all kinds of material goods, you desire relationships, you desire jobs, you desire houses, uh, and all all these things can be very complicated, but it's very simple in the end. You, you any of these things you want it because it, uh, you you want it because it will either allow you to escape from some unpleasant feeling or it will give you a pleasant feeling. <clears throat> and if you look carefully at any particular desire and trace it back and say, why do I want this thing? You'll always, and if you keep tracing it back, you'll always bottom out at, at, at this point, at, at maximizing pleasant feeling or minimizing unpleasant feeling. So it's the, that's the root of craving. That's all we really crave in the final analysis is sukha vedana and escaping from dukkha vedana. <clears throat> and the um, the uninstructed being in the world will spend lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes literally chasing after sukha vedana and escaping from dukkha vedana, like a hamster in a wheel. We don't don't uh, uh, don't get anywhere. <clears throat> and that there's always the there's always the belief um, that whatever object it is that is desired at this point in time is the one that will make us happy. Now people have this always have this kind of illusion that the, either the um, uh, the new job or uh, the boyfriend or the girlfriend or um, uh, the new car or the new computer uh, uh, whatever it is that they're currently desiring that's what they need to be happy and when they get it it will provide a certain amount of pleasant feeling but it's the nature of samsara that nothing is completely satisfying the desire mind is insatiable it's a bottomless pit so the mind is will experience some sukha vedana and then it'll get its little hit of sukha vedana then it will want something else so desire mind continues endlessly Um, so understanding this and seeing how you know, where this craving comes from is, you know, is the stage where we can begin to stop the wheel from turning around. If it's not stopped at that point, then it continues on from craving to clinging, which is an intensification uh, from uh, from craving to a to a much stronger grasp. The mind grasping onto the object, holding onto it. Um, and at that point, it's pretty. We're pretty well slipping out of the realm of uh, uh, where we can do anything about it, and we're hooked. And we have to. We end up riding around the wheel one more time until we get the next opportunity with the next moment of sense contact. But uh, at this point, we're we're, we're we, we've already lost it now, and we're. We've come into existence identifying with an object, object of desire. Uh, 
uh, clinging involves always involves this creation of a self view uh, because we're we have this relationship we are now defining ourselves in terms of our relationship to the desired object or the undesired object um, because we, we are providing a focus point a, a uh, of, of content for for the self view to gel around we're coming into existence and this is why the next stage is becoming bawa and we're, we're we're coming into existence as the, the 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 owner of this grasped object and this process um, this process occurs on on, on different uh, different time scales and different levels and it's important to understand that too that um, we generally when we talk about dependent origination we're talking in terms of lifetimes uh, and the first few stages are particularly um, appropriate for that type of uh, analysis but now at this point we can also see it happening very quickly uh, moment by moment and if you're looking if you're examining the mind carefully as in uh, insight meditation you'll see you can watch this process happening you can watch how the mind takes it, uh, an object occurs to the mind the mind reacts to it and craves it and clings to it and this can be both either negative or positive clinging you know aversion is, a, is just a form of negative clinging we're still coming into existence as uh, and and, and uh, the clinging is in this case is a pushing away <clears throat> but the mind is identifying itself to this object of consciousness so so we're lost in our in terms of to bring it down to a practical point of meditation we're lost in our thought processes the thought processes is not if the process, thought process is seen objectively then it, it, it's an object of meditation it's not identified to but if we take a subjective inside interest in it and we get involved in it and, and we ride that train of thought then we've lost the stream of meditation we're coming back into existence we're we're practicing craving and clinging uh, and you can observe that for yourself how that works when you do meditation um, when the mind does wander off and it uh, you know it, it it does do that <laughs> you know repeatedly then uh, that, that's not to be upset about that to take that as a opportunity for practice to see oh okay that's how that works I've gone off the track I've I've now I'm coming into existence thinking about this and that and then there's a moment of clarity and you bring the mind back to the meditation um, sometimes it's useful to actually do some uh, retrospective analysis and when the mind's gone and that's the point where we lose the meditation it's not in the thinking thought is an automatic process that will arise it's an object of consciousness and we come into birth jati and that can be understood uh, it, uh, in a very literal sense in, in, the, in the sutta explanation when the Buddha expounds upon the dependent origination and, and defines the terms he always defines jati in terms of birth in the, to this or that order of being so physical birth but it can also be understood as happening momentarily as a momentary um, 
culmination of, of becoming, that we, we, we are reborn each moment. <clears throat> um, sometimes, this is a, uh, a bit of a digression, but sometimes the question arises when people are um, asking about uh, Buddhist teachings, it's a very common question, actually a question that goes right back to, at least to King Melinda's, uh, the, the questions of King Melinda. Uh, is how we reconcile the teachings of not-self and rebirth. Because there's, there is rebirth, but there's nothing which is reborn. Um, <clears throat> the way to, to look at that is to forget about uh, birth and death for, for uh, a moment and just think about... Um, a succeeding series of moments within this lifetime as you sit here this evening this series of moments in your mind uh, what's the connection there there's one moment arising followed by another according to a causal pattern um, and there is actually no uh, continuity of substance it's a continuity of uh, cause and effect in a pattern and if we understand that that there's no continuity within there's no essential uh, continuity within within a single lifetime then the question about rebirth becomes trivial because we see this a special case only in that the physical basis falls away but if the the causal pattern of the mind of uh, craving, causing consciousness to arise to an object, if that is still there, if, in other words, if the being is not yet an arahant, then um, by the laws of cause and effect, the mind will want to rise to an object, and will uh, the energy is there, it will do so. But the physical base of the body has fallen away, uh, is is no longer functional, so that it must arise elsewhere. So, so that's how the that's how beings come into birth, because of all these previous causes. Um, craving is present, karma is present when a being dies and this energy causes uh, a strong impulse for completion the, the, uh, and, and the consciousness must arise again in, in appropriate conditions <clears throat> so having come into birth then to complete the cycle of the dependent origination uh, whatever, whatever arises ceases this is one of the basic fundamental laws of samsara whatever comes into existence passes out of existence so because of birth old age and death well, this is that pretty well sums up the that phrase because of birth old age and death pretty well sums up the human existence that's 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 our that's our life because we're born we get old and die <clears throat> Um, and if the being dies unliberated then ignorance is still present and the whole cycle starts again because of previous karma rebirth linking consciousness creates a new body and mind sense bases and opens the door for contact and everything else so it's a cycle. <clears throat> <clears throat>